A, Fort Pickett has a capacity of 1,000 Afghans, and we're working with the other two installations, Holloman and Quantico, to finalize their final respective uh, capacities. Additionally, while not a task force, U.S. Northern Command is supporting Operation Allies Refuge with services and additional forces, including assisting with managing the flow of evacuees at Dulles Airport and the Philadelphia International Airport in Pennsylvania. That airport is opening up today. Additional sites are possible. Uh, here's a snapshot real quickly of some of the numbers that you'll see at the task forces. So Task Force Eagle at Fort Lee, Virginia stood up in July and currently has a capacity for 1,750. To date, Task Force Eagle at Fort Lee has supported 1,647 Afghan special immigrant visa applicants and their families, nearly half of whom have completed the process and have moved on with the support of the Department of State, non-governmental, intergovernmental organizations, and volunteer organizations. Task Force Bliss at Fort Bliss, uh, Fort Bliss Texas currently has a capacity of 5,000 and received first flights with vulnerable Afghans on Saturday, August 21st. The base has supported to date 2,160 Afghans housed in a mix of hard and soft structures. Final capacities expected to be at least 10,000. Task Force McCoy, Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, currently has a capacity of 10,000 and received their first flights with at-risk Afghans on Sunday, August 22nd. To date, Task Force McCoy has supported 2,383 Afghans who are being housed in hard structures with shower and bathroom facilities located in each building. Task Force Liberty at Joint Base McGuire-Dix Lakehurst, New Jersey, currently has a capacity of 3,500 and received its first group of Afghans Wednesday, August 25th. Uh, to date, Task Force Liberty has supported 1,192 Afghans who are being housed in a mix of hard and soft-sided structures. Final capacity at Task Force Liberty is expected to be at least 10,000. So today, our total capacity at these four uh, insta installations is approximately 21,000 and growing. We're steadily working uh, to increase capacity to the 50,000 number by September 15th. The number of military installations uh, supporting this effort could increase in the future. The request for assistance from the State Department specifically requested that the Department of Defense provide culturally appropriate food, water, bedding, religious services, recreational activities, and other services such as transportation from the port of entry uh, to the location of accommodations and some medical services as well. A my team of military, civilian, and contract personnel are working closely with the numerous agencies, both government and non-government, uh, to ensure further requirements and additional capabilities are available for vulnerable Afghans. In addition, the Department of Homeland Security is working to conduct the screening and security vetting for all special immigrant visa applicants and other vulnerable Afghans in the fastest way possible, consistent with the dual goals of protecting national security and providing protection for vulnerable Afghans who supported the United States. That process involves biometric and biographic screenings conducted by intelligence, law enforcement, and counterterrorism professionals from across the interagency community. We are working around the clock to vet all Afghans being evacuated before allowing them into the United States. During recent visits to Fort Lee, Fort McCoy, and Fort Bliss, I saw the operation firsthand. And I'm proudly watched our U.S. personnel operating with compassion as they helped Afghans and their families who have done so much for the United States and our allies through two decades of conflict. Uh, I also talked with some of the Afghans in each location. During a conversation I had with one Afghan family, I asked if, if they had what they needed, if they were doing okay, getting enough to eat, and getting enough to sleep. Uh, the father thanked me, saying they had what they needed, and that it was the first time in a long time that he has slept without being afraid for his family's safety. So thousands of soldiers, sailors, sailors airmen, uh, Marines are working across the United States to complete this incredibly important mission to provide our Afghan colleagues a safe harbor while they finalize their immigration process. I'm also grateful for the support of the communities surrounding each of our bases and for the volunteers and others who are aiding in all of these efforts. Together, we're honor, honoring our commitment uh, to our Afghan partners and their families. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you, General. We'll start with Lita. Hi, General. Lita Baldor with the Associated Press. 
I have one quick numbers question for you, and then uh, a second. Um, can you tell us how many evacuees have gone through Dulles? The governor said today the number is 14,000. We were told earlier there was about 7,000 SIV. Can you square those numbers for us? Uh, and then I have a follow up. Lita, unfortunately, I don't have a specific number for you. State Department would be best to answer that. Uh, I can tell you what has come to us, and that's uh, 6,578 at four separate locations. I will tell you what we're seeing uh, is of those that do arrive at Dulles, uh, about 40% or so have been coming to us. Others have been uh, AMSITs and in other status, uh, such as having a green card already where they could move on from Dulles. Thank you. And my follow-up is, can you give us an assessment of both the security risks as well as the COVID risks. As you're doing, and everyone is doing these screenings, what security risks are you seeing? Are you seeing a number of people who are showing up on uh, lists? And then what about COVID? How is that testing going? And what are the threats at the bases for COVID? Uh, thanks, uh, Lita. So for security, I, I would defer to DHS who runs that operation. I'm very comfortable. Uh, we've worked to streamline that operation. Uh, as I said in my opening comments, we're doing biographical and biometric testing across the various uh, agencies of the interagency to include our counterterrorism and intelligence communities. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, folks coming across cleared by that process, process uh, which I'm comfortable with. With regards to COVID, uh, the Afghans coming uh, from uh, the Middle East into our uh, locations that we have stood up are all being tested actually multiple times. We test them 100% upon arrival at each location. They're getting tested at Dulles as well, and in route they get tested. I'll give you some numbers. Uh, we are seeing uh, so far to date, when I was at Fort McCoy on Wednesday, only three out of more than 1,300 had tested positive. When I went to Fort Bliss the same day, one out of more than 1,200 had tested positive for COVID. I hope that helps. Thank you. Who's the last number? One out of uh, 1,200. Jen? Hi, General Van Herk. It's Jennifer Griffin with Fox News. Um, I just want to go back a little bit to numbers. What percentage would you say of the uh, people who are processing onto these bases are SIV holders or applicants? Or are you also um, housing people who uh, apply for refugee status? Just trying to understand the breakdown of who is on these bases. And, um, and then secondly, there are reports from Dulles that some of those uh, Afghan, some of the commercial flights that have come in have had to keep people on the tarmac on board planes for up to 10 hours while screeners come on board. Is anything being done to rectify that? Is that a DHS issue? Or are you aware of that issue at Dulles? Right, thanks, Jennifer. On the SIV numbers, I'd defer to the State Department. I don't have that exact number in front of me. Uh, what I would tell you is the SIV numbers uh, have not been uh, in excess of 50%, but I don't have the, the detail right now. With regards to the problems you're describing at Dulles, I am aware of the longer waits that you described. Uh, we worked very hard over the last couple of days to make the process as efficient and effective. When I say we, DOD worked with the process owner, DHS, uh, to streamline this, specifically Customs and Border Protection along with the TSA, who, who owns that process, if you will. Some of the challenges were being uh, use of the uh, proper uh, vetting uh, authorities, if you will, to ensure that we looked uh, at the same ones and that they were coming across. We knew exactly who uh, was certifying that, and that's customs that was certifying it across to the other side. What was happening is if the uh, improper uh, system was utilized, they were being flagged as red on the receiving end at Dulles. That should actually give you comfort, Jennifer, that, uh, that, that we're not leaning towards more conservative of pushing them out, but actually ensuring verification. Uh, that led to the uh, delays that you're talking about. When I took the brief this morning, uh, we had no airplanes on the ramp waiting at Dulles uh, for uh, processing through customs. Uh, and I don't have an update for you right now, but I believe we're in a good position, Jennifer. Tara. Thank you. Uh, General Tara Kopp with Defense One. Uh, following up on Jen's question, can you talk about the uh, 
challenges that you've had with the DOD and DHS systems, the biometric systems, actually being able to pass that information in a timely manner um, and explain a little bit more about how all of the, the different flagging red that you've seen because names were passed through different systems? I really can't answer that question. That's a, a question for DHS and I, I apologize. I just don't have that uh, information. And um, to follow up uh, a little bit more humanitarian, with all of the thousands of Afghans that are going onto these bases, you know, many of them left their country with very little and probably have different levels of means to start life over here. Uh, how long is DOD prepared to house and feed these refugees? We're prepared to house them and feed them as long as it takes to get them through the process and as long as the secretary uh, approves that. Um, I agree with you. They're coming here uh, starting over with what they bring with them. We, we've been incredibly uh, well supported by the local communities, uh, the non-governmental organizations, et cetera, that have jumped in uh, to help these families with uh, things of need, such as uh, diapers, formula, uh, clothing, you, you name it. You, you see the gamut when you're talking these large numbers, and we've just been uh, tremendously blessed to have great support willing to, to host as they go through the process, um, what do you mean by the process? Can, if they don't have a place to go, how long can they stay on base? Well, they stay on, uh, they'll stay on base until they complete the uh, special immigrant visa processing process, which is owned by the State Department with uh, support. We provide medical support. We provide uh, contract medical support as part of that. So each of the uh, applicants will go through a screening process, such as screening for, um, you know, diseases, uh, vaccinations, if they need vaccinated. Uh, we'll have the International Migration Organization come in towards the end of the process and uh, work with them on where they need to be relocated. Many of them have family already here in the United States, or they'll be relocated to places where there's already Afghan populations, et cetera. What we saw at Fort Lee uh, with those that already had some type of a special immigrant visa processing is that was taken about five to seven days. Uh, we won't know exactly how long that's gonna take until the State Department and everybody is on the ground full up and we're ready to begin processing. Remember, we've only been that at this for a few days. And so at each location, we're gonna spin up uh, rather quickly here and begin the uh, application and the process for a special immigrant status. Or, the, uh, Orrin Lieberman from CNN. The SIV application process, the screening process, is a long process. What happens <laughs> if at some point while somebody is on a military base, they, they fail that screening? Are they going back to Afghanistan or, or, or what's, the, what's the plan there? And then, John, are you also taking questions? Later. <laughs> <laughs> I would defer you to the Department of the State uh, for that. That's really their, their uh, uh, area of expertise. Uh, we're prepared to uh, continue this support until we get through this process in support of the State Department. Be a, a plan here, somebody, if somebody fails a screening process and is already on a U.S. military facility. So, so let me go back, Orrin. So they have gone through the screening process. Uh, before putting feet in the continental United States from a security perspective. When they are uh, through customs, they are paroled into the United States of America. And uh, if they have uh, relatives, uh, th theoretically, they can go with those relatives. What we're doing is helping them get through the screening process. And so we provide all of the uh, governmental organizations to support that, the medical process, et cetera. And so we are not doing security screening uh, in support of State Department. This is part of the application for special immigrant status. I hope that clarifies it. Thank you. Tony. Hi, so Tony Capacio with Bloomberg News. Do you have a breakdown by gender roughly of how many women, girls, boys, and men have been processed by DOD? And it begs a lot of questions in terms of separate facilities. And then I have a second question about culturally appropriate food. Are we talking MREs or humanitarian MREs or uh, local kitchens being hired up to cook? Thanks, Tony. Uh, so we're seeing about 50-50 male, female. That, that can change back and forth. We're seeing about 15% uh, with, with children. We're seeing a lot of, uh, of the females who are pregnant. 
so I don't have a, a specific detail for what you asked about for the total number with children, male, female, et cetera. But th that gives you an idea. Uh, we're seeing right now 513 children at one location for a total of about 30% of that, the, uh, the location. Uh, with regards to your second question, uh, we're, we contract to provide support, uh, you know, meals, uh, multiple meals for large windows. So for example, we'll provide a breakfast meal for a halal for their culturally appropriate for a three hour window. We'll shut down for a second. And when I say we, it's a, the contract support at each location. Uh, then we'll spin up for a lunch meal and we'll do the same for the, the dinner. Uh, most locations I believe will have or do have a 24 hour grab and go culturally uh, uh, for the, uh, the Afghans as well. I hope that answers your food question. Can we go to the phone chair and that Laura Seligman Politico? Hi, John. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask, um, first of all, uh, Ned Price earlier said that he didn't know how many SIVs have been evacuated. Can you square that, uh, General, with uh, the numbers that you gave earlier? Um, is there a discrepancy between the ones that have been evacuated and the, the total number of people that have come to the United States. Um, what's, what is, what is the difference there? And what is it that we're missing? Hey, Laura, you're, you need to ask the state department. I, I don't have that data for you. Uh, that's a question for them. And are there, as a follow-up, are there how many SIVs um, and other Afghans do you estimate are still at the Kabul airport awaiting a flight out? I'll defer to General McKenzie and the forces for it. I don't know that answer. Uh, the State Department or CENTCOM may have that answer for you, Laura. Today, it was about between three and 5,000 earlier today. But as we have talked about before, this is a snapshot in time, and it literally changes by the hour. But uh, the last uh, so thing that I saw was somewhere between three and 5,000. But again, changes hour to hour. Courtney? Hey, General Van Herc, it's Courtney QB from NBC News. I just have a couple of clarifications. So when you talk about how they, uh, these individuals have already gone through the screening process before they even set foot here in the United States, does that mean that their names have already been run through the National Counterterror Database? Uh, Courtney, thanks. Uh, it is my understanding that each one of them and their names and their biographical data and their biometric data has been run through the established databases. Second, you also mentioned some of the medical support that the military is providing, including vaccinations. Does that include uh, COVID vaccines at the bases? Are those mandatory or optional? Uh, the, the vaccines are offered to them. They're offered at Dulles. Uh, we offer them as well as the task force locations. They are not mandatory. Uh, we see many of them are taking the vaccine if they've not already had it. One uh, on the paperwork that's that they're they're getting assistance for their SIV paperwork. Is there any U.S. military component? Like, do you have any military members who are assisting with that paperwork? So the the paperwork on our end for accountability purposes, where where they arrive at the task forces, we absolutely are part of that paperwork process to ensure accountability, to provide security, et cetera, for them. Uh, at each of those locations. Prior to arriving at our task force locations, we are not directly involved with the uh, paperwork process. Uh, I don't know the role in CENTCOM of any of their forces. I defer you to General McKenzie uh, on questions for any DOD members forward. Megan. Uh, General Van Herk, it's Megan Myers from Military Times. I wanted to ask uh, why these particular bases were chosen for SIVs. Was it because of space reasons, hard and soft um, you know, buildings, and or was it because of proximity to Afghan communities in the area where some of them might end up being resettled? Um, it, it was not necessarily for the specific location to an Afghan community. The department took a look at each location to ensure they had sufficient capacity, uh, that there was uh, capability in the region to support that. The limits of uh, readiness and training for the local in, uh, in, or, uh, infrastructure and the uh, basis was also a consideration. Those were all uh, provided by the services. The services uh, provided within the, the uh, recommendations for the department, uh, they took a, lot, a look at each uh, location and offered up those uh, installations for approval by the department. 
Yeah, we'll take one more, and then we're going to let the general close it out. Therese? Hi, General Van Herk. My name is Therese Garnier. I'm with Newsy. Uh, for the children that are on base, um, are, are there any educational classes being provided for them? Um, if not, are those children able to go to the CDCs on base um, to help kind of with babysitting and kind of educating them um, on American ways and whatnot? That's a, that's a great question. So to answer the last part first, uh, currently I'm not aware of any of them using uh, CDCs on base, but what I would tell you, there's an outpouring of support in the local areas, local communities, uh, organizations, non-governmental uh, that have showed up at each location to provide uh, uh, coloring books, uh, books to read, educational opportunities, uh, sports. Uh, at Fort Bliss, when I was down there, the soldiers had built uh, soccer goals and set up uh, soccer uh, areas for them to uh, practice and play soccer to keep them occupied. So that's a great news story. Okay, General, sir, I'm going to turn it over to you for any closing thoughts you might have. Well, thanks, John, and uh, for everybody uh, in the room and on the phone. It's a, it's a privilege to talk to you today, and it's really a privilege to be executing this mission for those that have helped us for uh, oftentimes a, a couple of decades. Uh, we continue to, to look forward to supporting them. Uh, we're prepared to do this uh, as long as it takes to ensure uh, that we get them settled here uh, back in the United States of America. Uh, I'm really proud of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, uh, Coasties. I've got Coasties here working for us, uh, Guardians, you name it. Uh, we're working very hard. Every time I look them in the eye and I talk to them, you cannot imagine how proud and privileged they are uh, to support this mission. And they tell me that all the time when I've been out on circulation. I feel the exact same way, and we look forward to continuing to make this a, a successful operation. So thanks for letting me tell the story. General, appreciate your time this afternoon. Okay, I got time to take a, a few on my own. Just, just two quick things that I think popped up on social media in the past hour or so. Um, firstly, uh, have the Taliban entered or taken control of any parts of the military section of HKIA that you're aware of? The Taliban are not in control of any part of Hamid Karzai International Airport. I saw that report too. It's false. Including any of the gates? They, don't they are not in charge of any of the gates, uh, are not in charge of uh, any of the airport operations. Uh, that is still under U.S. military control. Lita. John, can you give us any further details on the attack at this point? Um, anything about whether uh, the Marines noticed the attacker coming? Um, anything about the, sh the, the firing of the shots? Has any of that been kind of cleared up at this point? I don't have any additional details from uh, what General Kim McKenzie laid out yesterday. Again, we're going to do the forensics on this and, uh, and, and try to learn as much as we can. And when we have some verifiable context to be able to talk to you about that. We'll, we'll do it, but we're still digging into it right now. Uh, do you have any uh, timing on when you believe uh, the, air, the um, aircraft with the remains will arrive at Dover? I, I don't. Uh, and uh, as you might Im imagine, we're uh, in the services are in contact with the families, and they'll notify the families. Uh, uh, th through the casualty assistance uh, case officers, and I think I want to respect that process. Um, as you know, uh, sadly, from covering this for so long, Lita, I mean, it doesn't, uh, you, usually the, uh, it, it, the process doesn't take that long. Will the President and Secretary go to Dover to meet the families of the fallen? Uh, I'm not, I don't have any uh, uh, schedule announcements uh, to make, uh, but uh, we're all mindful of, uh, of the importance uh, of any return uh, of, of fallen members, and certainly these included, but I just don't have any things to announce from a schedule perspective. Tony? Do you have any status report on the 17 wounded at Landstuhl in terms of whether they're mostly stable or out of, out of danger? Or I don't have an update on the wounded. Um, the, the, the last count I had was that 20 of them had gone to Landstuhl. Um, the remaining, uh, there was some additional wounded, uh, but that they were treated on site and return to duty. I don't know what the, the status is. And as you know, Tony, we don't usually get into the details of, uh, uh, of wounded, even anonymously. We just don't typically talk well, about that. It would be useful to you get a sense of whether most are stable or in emergency. Just I, I, I'm not going to promise that, Tony. And we, we just don't 
talk about the status of, of wounded, as uh, I think you can understand. I mean, there's real privacy issues there that we want to be mindful of. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We'll see you. Uh, I'm planning to do this again tomorrow morning. Uh, so I'm shooting for around 11 o'clock in the morning uh, tomorrow to, for a, a regular update with uh, General Taylor. Uh, and then we'll see what the rest of the weekend looks like. All right. Thank you.